So I'm Juliet Mutahi from IBM Research Africa, and we, I'm going to present the results of a study that we had in an African classroom where we we're trying to um, study the performance and engagement of learners and try and um, demystify what can we derive out of all this. So the study was done as a multidisciplinary team where we have a mix of software engineers and research scientists who are trying to bring together their knowledge in order to um, understand this field. Um, so I'll start off with history. So in September 2000, the year 2000, we had the largest gathering of leaders sitting down together at the UN Millennium um, conference and what came out of that was that there is a need to improve um, the, the, the there was a need to have the millennium, millennium development goals the second goal was that there is need to improve accessibility to education so what does this mean at the end of this conference all the world leaders came back home and they had to change their policies in their countries so in the country that I come from which is Kenya what the government decided to do was to implement free primary school education. In January 2003, we had the first round of free primary school education where um, the enrollment increased from 5.8 million pupils to 7.2 million pupils. So generally what we can see in this chart here is the ratio of pupil to teacher um, in the various countries and Africa has the highest um, pupil to teacher ratio with some countries having the ratio as high as 60 pupils to one teacher. So this poses a very significant problem in the teacher because what's the quality of education that is being delivered to this student? The teacher is not able to monitor at what level the student is able to receive this education if they actually get it at all. That's one of the problems that we encounter. So while the classroom size is increasing, the world is moving on. And there's anywhere, anytime learning, which is being adopted by very many parts of the world. So Africa is playing catch up, and we're trying to involve ourselves in an area where we're not quite ready for it. So some of the challenges that we encounter is that content is increasingly becoming digitized. There's a significant shift towards technology-enabled blended learning, where on one hand you have the traditional classroom, and then on the other hand you have the online resources which you can use to supplement your learning. ICT in schools is becoming a reality, and uh, using Kenya as an example again, last year, which is 2016, there was this sensitization where the government dished out tablets to primary schools, and that is used as one of the modes of learning. But what we re realize at this point is the learning content on these devices is very different from what the teacher is actually delivering in a classroom. The cost of computer devices has fallen drastically, so the availability of these devices to anybody is very, very easy. And finally, there's a growing willingness to pay for education. What people have realized that education is the key. It's what opens doors and prevents the poverty, reduces the poverty levels in our countries. So we have all these challenges. What can we do about them? So typically, since we're trying to play catch up, there's this dual approach to learning where you have the traditional classroom where the teacher stands up and presents the learning material to the student and then you have the other way of learning where the teacher is removed and you have an online platform. The challenge that we have with this is that there's no synergy. The information is not being shared between the teacher in the classroom and what the, the students are learning in the classroom. So there's limited or no information sharing between the two and the teacher is not able to know what the teacher has, the student has learned or in any cases, how the student has approached that learning process. There are various ways to approach learning. What the teacher would teach versus what the online system would teach are two different ways. Having in mind all these challenges, we embarked on a journey to see how we can help the primary schools in Africa to solve some of these problems. So as IBM, we partnered with a primary school and 
We had a series of workshops with the teachers just trying to understand how they approach learning and the different ways in which they do this. So we had workshops with them, we had design thinking sessions with them where we took their learning curriculum, tried to understand how they deliver learning, we did immersions in the classroom to understand how they interact with the students. We also attended some of the practical sessions where they used the um, online learning tools to just have a good understanding of how all this comes together. So at the end of the workshop, two things came out. So we understood that blended learning environment should be seamless and should support su several modes of learning where not only in the classroom but also outside the classroom. And then during the blended learning journey, there should be support for tracking the student engagement with the learning material. So out of this, we came up with a system that addresses these two issues primarily, and we call this the Cognitive Learning Companion. So the Cognitive Learning Companion is a mobile-enabled platform that supports three modes of learning. So we have the school mode, remote mode, and interactive mode. In the school mode, the application acts as an assistant to both the teacher and the student in the classroom. While in remote mode, the application acts as a partner to both the teacher and the student. So while the teacher is acting remotely away from the student, he's still able to see the interactions that the student has with the application and the learning journey. Finally, in interactive mode, the teacher is removed from the system and the system acts as a tutor to the student. So now we introduce a cognitive system that enables the student to learn So while we are interacting with the student through these modes of learning, we're collecting data continuously and trying to update their learning model. So we have a user model that is associated with every student, and we're able to look at similarities between various students and try and derive what would be the best learning patterns for the various clusters of students. So looking at the architecture, so this architecture is quite detailed, but I'd like us to focus on two main components at the moment. So we have at the very center the digital learning environment, which is basically the interface which both the teacher and the student will interact with. So this is where we have the content viewer, which gives you access to the learning material, which can either be video lectures, it could be PDF material, it could be quizzes which are in text form. You have the guided lecture planner, which is available to the teacher, which enables them to plan their lectures beforehand before they deliver the learning material to the students. You have a discussion facilitator, which is a feedback loop where the students can write their comments on how they viewed the lectures or even ask questions. And then we have the adaptive tutor, which is now the cognitive implementation of the application. So at the backbone of this, we have the event framework which is mainly the system that collects all the interaction data with the application. So let's look deeper at the event framework. So the event framework collects two sets of events. So there's the application events and then we have the sensor events. So this, uh, this framework is deployed on a device such as a tablet device which has a variety of sensors such as the accelerometer, the GPS, um, a camera which can has face detection, and all these sensors are activated on the device. So at the application level, you have the various interactions which are taking place on the device, and all this is collected. So once the information is collected, it is then stored at an offline level on the device um, using JSON, which is a dictionary-based um, implementation. So JSON is dictionary-based where you have the key labels. So for every interaction, you have a label and the associated value with it. So using IBM technology, we have an offline implementation of the, of the events on the device. And once you get connectivity, this is then synced back to the server, which then does the analysis. So this is an example of some of the events that we collect for the various types of uh, media. So we have the videos, we have the text documents, and we have the assessments. 
and there are various kinds of activities that we monitor along the way. So once we had this system and we built it, we undertook a pilot in one of the primary schools. So our target pilot deployment environment looked like this, where we have the application deployed on tablets. We have all the interaction data being collected on the device. Once we have a connectivity with the internet, all this data is being synced back to the backend, where we have various IBM technologies that analyze this data and then give us some um, insights out of it, which is then pushed back to the applications. So the deployment composed of um, a classroom of grade five students, which is about 10 year old. Um, the classroom had 27 pupils who were studying mathematics and science. So why we chose these two subjects is because they are quite interactive subjects and we were able to extract the most interactions and data out of it. Four teachers were involved in this. Two of them were the subject teachers and then two were head teachers who just did a monitoring of the entire pilot system. So each of the students and the teachers were equipped with an Android device which was loaded with the application and they got to interact with it over a four week period. So this is an example of one of the classroom interactions. So we, we mentioned blended learning a lot and in this case we can see that student has a device, the teacher has a device, but we're still making use of the traditional blackboard. So this is for illustrative purposes. Um, using math as an example, you having the step-by-step -step calculation of um, a question, you have to use the blackboard so that these students can be able to understand how to approach a problem. So in this case, we have a teacher who has given an, a question out and the students are lifting up their hands. So there's still the interpersonal um, interaction between the teacher and the student, as well as the interaction which we can collect on the devices. In this next case, we have a student who's using the device in remote mode. This was inside a school bus. So while they're going back home, they can still log into the application and continue the learning journey. So during this learning, during this pilot, we collected a lot of data and we tried to analyze it and see what kind of insights that we could collect. So the first insight was classroom alignment. So from the previous picture, you saw that a teacher had their own tablet device and the students have their own tablet device. So ideally what happens is both, both the teacher and the student are locked to the same content material. The only difference is that the teacher's content is instructional while the students is more of an absorption, what they will learn out of it. So this was a lesson on LCM, least common multipliers, and we can see that the focus on the teacher was on page five and six, which was more on how to approach the problem. When you look at the students' interaction on the lower graph, we can see that the students were more focused on page two and three. So when we went back to look at the content material, we realized that page two and three was more on the prerequisite which is needed for you to approach an LCM problem. The teacher was unaware of this and the teacher had progressed to much advanced levels in the classroom while the students were being left behind. Um, for more insights, we looked at the performance in a classroom. So we have the time spent on a quiz and we have the grid which has been achieved in terms of performance. And we're trying to look at, is there a direct correlation between the two? In addition, we wanted to include one last um, parameter, which is the difficulty level. So given the time taken on a quiz, given the performance, can we try and derive how difficult a set of quizzes are based on this? So, also, looking at the interaction patterns for various students, can we identify various patterns among the students such that we have one set of students who, have, who showed this set of activities, we have another set and another set, and eventually we are able to have learner profiles for the different students. So using our data, we tried to do an anal analysis, and in this case, we're looking at the grades achieved versus the time interval. And we're able to predict that for given quiz, 
students are more likely to perform better if they take about 200 to 400 seconds on the, on the quiz. But as they increase the time that they take on a given quiz, their performance starts declining. So this was a very interesting indicator because initially when we had the quiz, we didn't have any time that was allocated for a certain quiz. We only dependent on the teacher's knowledge on a given course material for them to determine if the quiz is going to take 10 minutes or five minutes. But after showing them this analysis, then we can now determine that for us to get the optimal results for a given quiz, then we should limit the amount taken for that quiz to possibly 600 seconds, which is about 10 minutes for us to get the best results out of the classroom. Um, something else that we observed along the way is content dependency. So with, within the four weeks, the students were learning three topics, which are um, LCM, least common multipliers, SMN, which is sum of multiple numbers, and ASF, which is addition and subtraction of fractions. So for you to advance from LCM to SMN, you have to first understand the prerequisite content. And as you advance to a more detailed, a more advanced topic, it requires you to gain a very high level, a very deep level of understanding for you to advance to the next. Looking at this, the first quiz which was given on LCM, we see that more than 75% or 69% of the class acquired a grade which was higher than 75%. And only 7.69% of the class got a grade which was less than 50%. But as we advance to more, um, to more advanced topics, we see that the performance of the classroom kept on decreasing over time where finally, if we look at addition and subtraction of fractions, we see that over 50% of the classroom had a grade which was less than 50%. So this kind of analysis is not available to the class teacher during a normal traditional class, because what traditionally would happen with every end of the month that give an assessment and assess all three topics at the same time, and they're not able to derive at which point they lose the attention of the student. Is it at the LCM point? Is it at the sum of multiple numbers? Or is it at the addition and subtraction of fractions? So when we gave this analysis to the teachers, they were quite appreciative of it because now they went back to look at their curriculum. They kind of shifted things so that they can have more emphasis on the LCM, such that by the time they advanced to the next topic, the students had a good understanding of what the prerequisite content was. Um, finally, we identified a set of students in the classroom. So these were very brilliant students who realized the loophole in our system. So um, for the quizzes that we were offering to the students, the students could easily pick any answers and submit the, the, the quiz. And what the system would give you back is analysis of how you performed on the question, on the, each of the questions, and what is the question, what is the wrong, which are the questions at which you got the wrong answer. So the students managed to game our system, and they would do this multiple times, trying to figure out which, would, which are the right answers. And over time, their performance increased. So you'd find a student who'd take up to 15 takes on a given quiz, and their performance increased. So initially, they'd get a 10%, and then their performance increased to a 20, all the way to up to 90 or 100%. So these are the outliers that we're able to identify for the math quiz and the science quiz students who we found are quite brilliant students. But the question that we were left with, did they learn anything out of this, or did they just <laughs> game our system? So some of the deployment challenges that we encountered is um, there was intermittent internet connectivity in the classrooms, which was quite a challenge because our system was fully reliant on internet connectivity. Um, also, the devices needed to be charged often because they consumed a lot of energy. So within the classroom, we'd find a case where about five devices would be low on power, and those students would have to share their devices, which wasn't the quite ideal case to collect the engagement data. So in conclusion, we found out that there's frequent misalignment between the pace at which the teacher teaches the students and the, the pace at which the students are receiving this learning material.
Also, the study revealed that there's a strong correlation between engagement and performance, and the more, engagement the more engaged students perform much better. So for future work, we'd like to enhance the system such that it's able to have real-time insights on the device and bring back this information to both the learner and the teacher without being too intrusive because of the set of the age gap that the age set that we are trying to interact with at this point. Um, we'd also like to enhance CLC such that it can work quite well in the resource constrained environment that we are interacting with. That's it. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Could, uh, could you talk a little bit more about the, the user or model user profile, what sort of features went in there, and how you found the closeness to other user profiles as you cluster them? Okay, so for the user profiles, we're mainly looking at the engagement data. So. Most of the content that we had was either in terms of video content or PDF content. And looking at the classroom environment, the students are more likely to follow what the instructor is saying as opposed to what they think is right. So we're trying to look at such interactions, who are more likely to follow the instructor and who are more likely to go at their own pace. And does this translate um, in terms of their performance, does it reflect in their performance? So that's how we're able to profile the students. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, so is the technology what's like IBM Watson around or it's totally different? Um, it uses some components, some components. Yeah, at the back. Okay. And for the sensor, in one of your slides, I saw video. Uh, I guess you are referring to student video. So did you collect any student video uh, for this study? Or? So video is the learning material. So having a, an illustrative video that tries to explain a concept. Ah, OK, because yeah. it was under sensors uh, category. I thought you are also collecting. Uh, no. Because of privacy reasons, we couldn't collect the front-facing camera videos. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very interesting work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I saw some of the courses that you run the system on. Is it just an example, or if this is run across all courses? The reason I'm asking is to get the dependencies between the content. If there's a human intervention, like an instructor needs to say that this is dependent, or do you read the content material somehow and identify these kinds of dependencies? So the teacher was burdened with preparing the content material. And so we were trying to derive the dependencies on our side based on the performance that we realized, right? So the curriculum, so let me start with the problem with the curriculum. <laughs> the curriculum is not well structured. So there's no, so this, the teacher knows that they need to instruct on these given topics and it's up to them to define the correlations, right? So using our system, we're able to define a more fine grained relationship between the different concepts and bring back this information to them so that they can restructure how they order their content. I have one. Uh, so it was more to do with the, the performance and the number of attempts that students have taken. Mm -hmm. And it's just the y-axis had, you know, numbered up into the hundreds of attempts. Like, so are you saying that there was a student attempted like a maths question six hundred times? Or no, no, no. So that's at a individual question level. Yeah, so we're looking at for a given question. Remember, we have the gamers who would quickly pick any question, submit, pick any question and submit. So for the... Um, This, for the math, so for the math quizzes, they had more time to work on their quizzes. So I guess that's when they had more time to try and game the system and figure out what happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, imagine you have 10 questions and yeah. they're all multiple choice. So you just pick, 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 submit, pick, 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 submit. So, yeah. So can, can then actually determine who those gamers were because you would have timestamps between how quickly they're going through those questions? Yes, that, that's how we were able to pick them out. So in, in more analysis, we're able to even drill down to the specifics. And funny enough, they were the same culprits for the math and the science. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. I have a question regarding the architecture. Yeah. Be before you came to the example mm -hmm. classroom situation, there was Moodle on the one side. It was not clear to me how Moodle was really connected to the to the companion. Mm -hmm. There were no links. Um, Level. So, yeah. And but let's ask concretely: Was Moodle used in the classroom? Or mm -hmm. I would guess no. No. So this. Yeah. Okay. So what we. What's the role of Moodle here? Um, so Moodle is what we used to feed our system with the learning content, and that was primarily Moodle's role. We didn't have any system that we could use to bring content into our system. So, okay, so you, before you could use content, you mm -hmm. would kind of transfer it from Moodle that you would just use as an archive yeah. into your companion, which would then also represent the content that you would usually have on the learning platform. Yeah. Is that a choice that you want to stick to? No. <laughs> no. Okay, so one, one power of Moodle that we're taking advantage of here is the ability to tag the content. So the content that we got was very raw, and very raw in terms of it had just been prepared by these teachers. The teachers had no prior um, education on how to prepare this content. So we just took in the content, tried to look through it, and we used Moodle to help us to tag it so that we could feed it into our system in a way that it could be consumed. So if at all Moodle was used also by the teachers or not by the, or not by the students? Or no, yeah, it was only not used by teachers, uh, not by the students, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry to tag. <laughs> Take the last question. I had a question about the uh, JSON representation of the events that you used. When yeah. you were coming up with the schema and the vocabulary you used to describe the events, did you use an existing standard or did you uh, come up with your own? Um, mostly we came up with our own because this was a new space for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this is what we had. So that's a vocabulary yeah. you guys came up with? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And we're hoping it will be adopted as a standard. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much.